to another episode of Productive Parenting, a show where I offer judgment-free advice on how to raise value-driven kids in a way that's right for your family using the most current research. I'm your host, Dr. Deanna Marie Mason. I'm a certified pediatric nurse practitioner, published author, and expert in child development. I'm also the mom of two gorgeous kids, and I know firsthand how much pressure and misinformation is out there. That's why I'm here. So grab yourself a cup of tea and settle in. And let's discuss today lying in a safe space and get some real honest answers so that we can raise our kids in a way that works for our family. Now this theme today of lies actually comes from a listener. Contact me about what to do when you catch your child lying. And it really sparked my interest because lying is an interesting thing throughout childhood. It doesn't mean the same thing in each age and stage. And I thought it would be great to focus an episode around this so we kind of flesh out the nuances and talk about some realistic responses when we catch our little one lying. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to find out what to do when we catch our child lying and learn that not all lies are equal. Most parents want to think the best about their children and it can be hard to know what to do if we catch our child in a lie. Um, But the truth is lying happens for many reasons during childhood and adolescence. And by understanding the developmental influences of lying, it's easier for us as parents to know how to respond. Lying is directly linked to brain development. And depending on the brain's capabilities to think and reason influences the capacity of our child to tell lies and why they may tell lies. When a small child tells a fib or an untruth, it's not necessarily for the same reason or to gain the same thing as perhaps a 17 year old. And that all comes down to our child's ability to think, process, their capacity to anticipate consequences, to manipulate, or try to control. And so I want to go through kind of each age and stage and what's happening in cognitive functioning so that you understand what your child is doing or where they're at at each age so when we talk about how to respond it will make more sense why that is so if we start with infants and toddlers we're talking about kids from birth through age three know that lying is really uncommon because your little ones at this age are still just learning how to communicate if an untruth is told, it's usually related to not understanding the use of language or the meaning of the word. Because your little one is still working on linking the symbolism between the word itself and the concept it represents, they don't have the cognitive function to manipulate those in any specific way. If there's any confusion, it's just an error. So We don't really worry about lying or untruths in children ages 0 to 3. Slightly older children ages 3 to 5 also can't really lie to deceive. They just don't have the capacity yet. Instead, they have something that is wonderfully called magical thinking. And magical thinking simply is a way that children ages 3 to 5 interpret what they are actually experiencing, and how they perceive things to be or wish they were. So they mix reality and fantasy because the world is so big to them that they can't possibly understand what's really happening around them. Even though they have this emerging and growing vocabulary, it still is going over their head. And so their brains, in order to kind of move through the world and try to figure out cause and effect in a way that makes sense to their developing brain, they mix reality and fantasy. And that's what magical thinking is. So anytime they tell an untruth, 
it's more often linked to them and their preferred mix of reality and fantasy than trying to deceive us. Our school age kids, you know, age five to 10, enter the stage of when lying really begins. School age children don't have abstract thought yet, but they are able to reason from the information that's captured through their senses. So what they see, smell, taste, touch, that kind of thing. And so when they tell untruths, school age kids are most often just going to change facts about an event or insert a desire or a wish in their lie. That's it. Because they they can't really manipulate anything yet. They don't have the abstraction in their thoughts. So they're just going to say that, you know, their homework got eaten by the dog rather than I didn't do my homework. Or that they ate their lunch rather than throwing it in the garbage bin. So it's going to be really concrete details that have been altered or changed based on what they desire or wish. But they won't be able to really go into extensive elaborate schemes because their brains aren't there yet. They're still in a concrete operations level. When we reach the tween years, that's when things start to change because our tweens, 10 to 13 year olds, do have the ability to construct lies. Uh, Their brains are developing abstract reasoning skills and from this they can mix the information that they capture through their senses with some ability to predict outcomes. So when they're telling untruths, our tweens generally are concerned with changing or inventing facts to drive a certain outcome or obtain what they desire. So they'll say that, yeah, there's other friends going to a party because they know that you may not let them go unless there's other people that you trust there. When in reality, they're going to a party of unknown children. So they won't make very elaborate things yet, but they know that if they change some aspects, they can manipulate a little bit the situation. They're not very good at it yet, and it's pretty easy to spot. However, that all starts developmentally with cognitive function during the tween years. Our early teens, 13 to 16 year olds, they normally have abstract thought by age 14, well-developed. So their brains can manipulate multiple scenarios and predict multiple outcomes. And so these early teens can construct pretty complex untruths, lies (laughs) that are based on facts, but then are embellished or edited to create a message that they desire to communicate. So this is when things start to get pretty pretty elaborated because they're able to think about your view, their dad's view, their mom's view, grandma's view, uh, teachers. I mean, multiple people's perspectives simultaneously so they can really tighten things up to create something that sounds realistic. And our late teens, age 16 to 19, have absolutely mastered abstract thought on a cognitive developmental level. And so their brains can reliably assess the information, draw conclusions, and anticipate the future events. So this altogether allows them to calculate risk. So they can determine whether it's worth it for what they want or not. And that means that they have the ability to fabricate complex believable untruths that can deceive or conceal factual realities. And with the egocentrism of adolescent, that puts them at very high risk for keeping from us as their parents significant events or activities that with their limited life experience, they don't know are as dangerous as they are. So untruths in late adolescence has the potential to be very, very risky. The question is, what should we do when we discover or suspect lies in our kiddos? And if we use this information that we just talked about, about how the brain develops as a guide, knowing what to do becomes much easier. We don't have to only focus on trusting our kids. We can also use some very logical, consistent means to respond to those lies. 
And the reason why I, I speak about this is because once our children know that we are going to follow a consistent pattern in addressing information that they share with us, not in the perspective of distrust, but in the perspective of, I understand who you are as a person and I understand your growth and development and your ability to think, and I'm going to help you be in line with our family values as you process through those. It actually creates a sense of security where kids don't feel that they need to hide things from you or manipulate, but rather they can just say, my mom understands me or my dad understands me. I can just go to them and talk about this. I don't need to be fearful of their reaction. I don't need to hide what's happening in my life because I know they're just going to accept me. So in this sense, you're actually drawing a closer relationship with your child when you acknowledge where they're at developmentally and adapt your parenting to meet that so that your child has trust in you and can just relax into the relationship. And you on the other side feel confident and in control. You don't have to be in this situation like, oh, I'm going to ruin the relationship with my 15-year-old if I question them where they're going to be. No, you know that you're going to ask them where they're going to be and follow up with some consistent, concrete follow-up questions to validate that. And they're going to know that's coming if you start this process from the very beginning or implement it and then stay consistent with it. So the purpose of understanding the cognitive development of your child at each age and stage is so that you don't need to worry about discovering or suspecting lies. You can just focus on helping your child manage their life and creating a trusting relationship with them where they can come to you and speak rather than trying to hide from you what's actually occurring. So let's talk about how to do that. With our infants and toddlers, as we talked about before, they can't lie. So if they're saying something that doesn't make any sense, clarify definition of words or the correct usage of language. And then, trust me on this, write the story down so you remember it because it most likely will be a good laugh when they graduate from high school or get married. We think we're going to remember all those funny stories, but we just can't. Time erases many of them. So keep a notebook and jot them down because it will be so funny later. Trust me. Our little preschoolers, age three to five, again, can't lie. They're just mixing reality with their creative imagination. The stories they're telling are just reflecting what their heart desires or their understanding of what's happening in the world that they yet can't truly comprehend. So the goal with our three to five year olds is to talk to them to find out what they're actually perceiving and if needed, talk to them in age appropriate language to explain how things really are. So an example of this would be seeing your three-year-old with chocolate on the corner of their mouth and cookie crumbs on their shirt. And you ask them, did you just eat a cookie before dinner? And their response is, no, I didn't eat a cookie. My imaginary friend ate it. As sweet as this answer is, we know that it's not the case and we need to let our child know that so a great response would be honey I see chocolate in the corner of your mouth and cookie crumbs on your shirt I think you ate the cookie we've talked about not having sweet treats before dinner and tomorrow we're going to try to do that better right now let's go wash your hands and face for our school aged kiddos age 5 to 10 Um, When we see small lies emerging in their stories, it's really a good idea to address them and not just let them slide by. Show them that you know the actual facts and then discuss with them what motivated them to change those facts. But rather than focusing on the, quote, badness of telling a lie, try to teach your child that there's better problem solving techniques. And what you're trying to do there is cultivate a trust between you and your child so that they don't feel like they have to hide reality from you. And 
you are showing them that you're involved and want to help them be successful. So sometimes in the rapid pace of life, it's really easy just to let things slide because you don't want to address it. But the truth is, if we do not address small untruths during the school age years of 5 to 10, it becomes really tricky to try to snuff it out when they're 10 to 13 in their tweens. So think about it as a proactive method not to have bigger problems later on. So when you do catch little tiny lies happening, just address them directly. Don't focus on, oh my gosh, I caught you in a lie. How bad is that? Because it's not, it's developmental. But you do need to address it so that they know that you're paying attention and that you're aware of what's going on. And that's actually going to create trust and a, and a good bond between you. And those five or 10 minutes it's going to take to address that uh, in the school age years is going to save a world of problems later on in the tween and adolescent years. And talking about the tween years, our 10 to 13 year olds, what's really important there when something's amiss is asking for more detailed, specific information can really help you identify when they're trying to say an untruth. If you do suspect a a lie, you should just ask your child again for a more complete response with more details. Because if you do find an untruth, the important thing to do is to talk to your child directly about what motivated them to change the information. Because that's the actually important part, not what they're doing, but why. And this is how you can find out if they're having problems at school with their friends, people are bullying them in the community, or they feel insecure about something at home. Sometimes our tweens, they're very sensitive to what's happening. And they might be concerned that by telling us the truth, that they're going to be burdening us. And so they might switch the facts actually as a means to protect us. And we want them to know that we're always the parent and they're always the child. We're always bigger, kinder, stronger, wiser. It's not their job to protect us. And so that can actually open a door to start talking about why they thought they should change the facts. And again, that creates a strong, trusting relationship. Our early teens, ages 13 to 16, with them, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. We need to ask for specific details and then double check those details at a later time to see if they're telling an untruth. Because early teens generally will say something, they say it really quickly, they haven't processed it fully. So if you ask them about it again later, you might find that the details have changed. And asking them to tell you again what will happen or what has happened is a great way of verifying whether they've kind of done some manipulation to the facts or not. Also, you can always call another parent to verify if the child was at a certain location or doing what they said they were doing. If you do catch your early teen in a falsehood, it is so important in their personal growth, moral growth, value development, that you give them an out, a chance to say the truth. And it's about respect. Your respect for them and their growing needs and their growing autonomy, but also respect for your expectations and holding them accountable to those. So if you, if your early teen has given you some fishy answers about where they were, you ask them to tell you again later, the information changes again, you call another parent to verify what they said they were doing, and allowed the teen to hear you on the phone during that conversation with the other adult and you find out that they've said something untruthful pause just a beat trust me on this don't hang up and start screaming or yelling pause a beat and say what should i know leave a nice big open ended question and give them the chance to tell you the truth Give them the chance to come clean. And more importantly, give them a chance to explain why they wanted to tell you an untruth. That interaction right there shows your teen that you are interested in them, 
and involved in helping them make good decisions and share truth before telling an untruth that they can come to you and just tell you because you're always going to be there. You're always going to listen. It's not a struggle for power of who's right and who's wrong. It's about we're in this together. You're there for them and they can trust you with what's going on in their life. They're not always going to like your answer, but they can trust you enough to tell you. So again, if you found that your tween has given you an untruth, give them a chance to come clean. Give them a chance to explain. And that over time is going to motivate them to avoid that more painful conflict of confronting you directly and just come up to you and talk to you first about what's happening in their life. Now, for our late teens, 16 to 19 years, it can be really difficult to detect lies in older adolescents because they have so much autonomy and ability to plan and improvise as needed. Their brains are as developed as an adult's. The only thing is they lack life experience, and this is what trips them up sometimes um, because that lack of experience can lead them into really negative situations that they, they just can't. They can't anticipate because of a lack of experience. Regrettably, parents often only find out about untruths in late adolescence when something negative has really happened. A phone call from a police officer, a dent in the car. It could be a child who goes missing for a few days as they try something, some adventure. And that can be very stressful to families. So... Open communication and honesty to address sensitive adolescent issues like drugs, alcohol, sex, and violence are really the only useful ways to reduce the likelihood of lying in late adolescent if you haven't already established a norm of truthfulness in your home. It can be hard for parents to discuss issues relevant to their teens on these very sensitive topics particularly because values and morals are involved. And there can be a feeling of judgment or concealment or unacceptance that sometimes runs between older adolescents and their parents. And so when you find yourself in a situation where your child isn't telling you a truth and a negative consequence has happened, it's very hard to intervene because you're not sure where you stand as a parent. You don't know where to ground your feet to start start helping them. I know of an example where a parent got a phone call that their son had been vandalizing some other people's property. He had been seen by some neighbors. Um, the neighbors had chased him. He had crashed his car. The police had picked him up. And when the parent came, he met his child and started talking, and the child just gave him this very long explanation. And then he went and spoke with the police, and that didn't match the story that the police report um, had. And the dad, unfortunately, in this situation, used some physical interaction with his child to try to coax him to tell him the truth, which never increases trust or security between a parent and child. But that parent in that moment felt so frustrated that he was unable to get a truthful answer out of his 18-year-old son that he went to his baser instincts and pushed him up against the wall and tried to force his son to, to speak. Not going any further into that story, the point is when we don't have a norm of truth in our home with our late adolescents, it can be very difficult to start creating that during that time period. The best we can do is to try to create that open communication to honestly address sensitive issues so that the teen at least has the confidence in the parent that when something bad does happen, they can reach out to the parent to provide appropriate support. In the end, We all catch our little ones telling untruths because it's a normal part of growth and development. But knowing what your child is capable of and why they may be telling lies is super useful to us as parents 
to inform our response. And additionally, when our children are caught lying, we can use that moment to teach lessons that reflect our family values and direct our children towards better behaviors by creating a stronger, more close family relationship with them, regardless of their age or stage. I want to thank again my listener for writing in about how to manage childhood lies. If you have any other questions like this listener or perhaps have doubts about another issue, don't hesitate to drop me an email at deanna at deannaremason.com. You can also find more about this topic and other similar topics on my website at proactiveparenting.com. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to find other parents just like you and talk about your strategies for proactive parenting. You can find me on all social media by searching for my name, Deanna Bray Mason. And finally, if you're interested in buying any of my books or online courses, you can find all of those on my website. Again, that's proactiveparenting.com. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and it helps you with being a proactive parent in your family. If you did enjoy the show, please tell a friend about it so they can also start to become a proactive parent. I'll wrap it up here. Thanks again for listening. I'm Dr. Deanna Marie Mason. Take care and be well. And until the next episode, bye-bye.